Hello, I'm Kieran Lynch, and welcome to Ovicast, the Chocolate Sheep Podcast. Each episode will bring you latest insights, advice, and technical updates for the sheep industry. This week's episode, we're joined by County Kildare sheep and beef farmer James Johnson and his chocolate advisor, Dr. Rachel Taylor, to get insight into James's system, grass and management, and how he's addressing some of the challenges he's facing going forward. We discuss grazing groups and use of temporary fencing, fertilizer, and soil fertility. Rachel and James outline plans for this year's silage crop, the importance of completing a father budget, and the role of high quality silage has for the winter ahead. We finish up the podcast with James outlining how he's going to incorporate red clover into the system in new reseeds and his plans for oversowing white clover into targeted areas each year. We start off, however, with James giving us a little bit of background and insight into his farming system. I'm farming here near Kildare Town. Um, we're on sort of dry, dry sandy soils. Uh, we're on uh, mid season. Uh, flocky oats, lamb and down uh, from 17th of March on, uh, along with a few EO lambs. So there's about, about 170 EO at the minute, and then there's about 50 EO lambs following on to them. And we run a, a dairy to beef system along with that, too. We, we bring 30 calves to beef every year as well, along with that. James, our system's heavily dependent on good grass and management, and something we're going to come to in a moment. Look, you're in, you're in the second half of lamb, and I suppose the main flock, James, is pretty much all lambed at this stage, are they? Yeah, yeah, very, yeah, there are only a few stragglers left. We're into the all lambs now. And cattle are already at grass, so you're, you're really up and going already. Yeah, yeah, no pressure's off now. James, just like from a grazing Honestly. management point of view, look, it's, it's key to both of them systems are high performance. How are you running them at the moment at grass? So the the yos, the lambs and the cattle are all moved into one batch and they're rotating over a, a paddock system at the minute. Um, they're, with the farm split up uh, sort of permanent blocks, pasture blocks of around four to five acres, but we can split them with temporary fences as needs be. Um, we're sort of rotating. Rotation there, we're the stock are grazing out a paddock in Anywhere, anytime from four to seven days, depending on period of the year or grass growth. Um, and when needs be, if, if it arises, we take out a surplus grass in bales. James, you, you're grouping up quite early on the farm. You're more or less pushing them into that group after a couple of days post turnout, I assume. I am, Karen, yeah. Um, so basically, once the lambs uh, has mothered up well with it with the go, um, they're dropped out to the field. And um, yeah, with very little problems doing that. They, they, they win with the cattle and she, uh, the, the rest of the cattle. And uh, they're all the O's here. We're short of mixed grazing for a few years now. So the O's and the cattle are all pretty used to each other. So there's very little there's very little disturbance when you drop out the O's and lambs. And the so I'm looking well. James, I suppose one of the big advantages you have, I know from speaking to you earlier, you had quite heavy covers at the start. You were able to get through them fairly quick in that system. Yeah, so the biggest, one of the biggest issues here we've had in the past is especially especially with the mild winters we've had in recent times, that the covers can, can grow very strong. Um, so that really spurred us on to, to use the temporary fences and, and get the stock tighter onto them to get them to take them off. Because if you don't take them off at the start of the year, it's a kind of a burden going forward for throughout the year, you know. So it's, it's very important here, we find, to get the, the heavy covers taken right down. Yeah, it's always that challenge. We love having grass to turn out, but getting it dealt with and getting into that second rotation is important. Look, you spoke there about the temporary fencing. Um, yeah, I'm assuming you're, you're working off mains electric. What kind of temporary fence and setup are you using? Yeah, it's very, it's very simple, very, very basic and simple. It's just basically uh, three gear reels and, pla- and white plastic posts. And um, we literally just feed off the most of the boundary has um, electric fence along it. And we just feed off that with three strands. And it looks, seems to work. We've, we've no real escapees or anything with it. It seems to work very well for us. So, um, so yeah, so that's it. That's it. It's quite simple and straightforward. And you, you've some of that already set up from torn out onward. Uh, yeah, well I do because I I basically try to get the lambs used to it um, as soon as possible. Really, uh, that's the the big thing about it is once the lambs and the oats get used to it going forward, you'll have no problems the rest of the year. It's probably it's probably a useful tip for money. Look, I suppose one of the big challenges this year, and you've you've already addressed some of them as far as you have the grazing group set up early. You have temporary divisions set up early, so you're protecting your regrowths. Fertilizer is a big challenge at the moment, and I'm going to bring in Rachel at this point. Like, you've completed a nutrient management plan for James's farm last year, and I know it's something, James, you've been working on for a number of years. What kind of soil fertility levels are we looking at, Rachel, and how 
is that going to be an advantage for James this year? Um, I suppose over the last few years, it's one thing that James has focused on is the soil fertility um, in order to maximise his grass growth. So on his farm, he's lucky enough that lime in the last round of samples we took wasn't needed. Soil pH range from about 6.2 right up to about 7.2. So I suppose it's, it's one of the things with the area that James is farming in. Some of the soil types pH is naturally quite high, so it's worth taking soil samples to see is is pH high because if it is and spreading lime could only lead to more problems in terms of P and K lock up opposed to releasing P and K. Um, the P's and K's index on the farm, P is high, it's three and four in across the whole farm. K is slightly lacking in some of the paddocks it's down to index two predominantly the ones where we're taking cuts of silage out of, but in the grazing ones, it was largely three. So there wasn't a huge need for compound fertilizer this year on the farm, uh, luckily for James. I suppose K can be a bit of an issue maybe now here. Like James, in terms of fertilizer purchases, it probably give you a little bit of scope. You've moved a little bit more towards straight nitrogen in a lot of areas, only targeting that compound where it's needed. What, from a grazing point of view, like is it urea you're going with for the main season or how have you change your approach for fertilizer this year? Yeah, so basically it's, it's predominantly urea and um, maybe then later on maybe it, uh, some protected urea and uh, maybe something with a bit of pink if, if there was the odd paddock was a bit low in indexes, maybe something like 18, 6, 12 or something um, just just to help balance out the, the, the low index there. But generally speaking, it's either urea or protected urea here, to be honest. So it gave you, gave you a bit more scope this year. Look, I suppose the other big challenge at the moment, and I think it's one we're already cognizant of, is planning for silage. James, you've some ground closed up at the moment, have you already for silage? I do, Karen. yeah. So the first two packs would have been grazed off with the sheep. Um, there's about eight and a half acres in total there. Um, last week there, we, we put out a bag and a half of urea onto it. The index is pretty high on them. It's index four and four. So we don't we didn't put out any P's and K's, but uh, we hope to cut that in the second week in uh, May, uh, weather permitting, of course. Like Richard, I'm just going to bring you in on this bit. I know you've completed a follow budget for James, and we'll come in on that one in a moment. And that early cut, that silage quality is vital in that system too. What does the follow budget look like, and why is that being an important thing to conduct at this stage of the season? Yeah, I think the fodder budget, everyone should really be doing one. Like it's no harm to know what you need on the farm. Um, and especially this year with the price that meal is going to be. Uh, I don't think we can rely on purchasing or buffering the diet with meal if we're short of fodder. And I don't think there's going to be the same surpluses of fodder around this year with everyone coming back to fertilizer prices. But the fodder budget is there on the Chagas website. It's a really simple tool to use. You just need to know a couple of simple pieces of information. So it's done for the dairy cow. It's done for sucklers, the different age category of your slaughtering cattle, your finishing cattle, and then your yoles. And all you need to know is the number that you're going to keep over the winter number of months that that they will be inside on silage and maybe give yourself a little bit of leeway add four to six weeks so you give yourself a bit of a reserve it has the calculation of how many tons the animal will eat per month so for argument's sake in terms of a yo the calculation is that she'll eat 0.15 tons of silage per month and you multiply that across and it'll give you a figure for total tons which you can use for your pit, or if you want to convert it into bales, then you just multiply your, your tons by 1.25 and it'll give you the total tons or bales needed on the farm. So in, in James's case, when we did it up with his calf to beef system and his yos, even though his yos are only in for a shorter period of time, he needs in the region of 350 bales for the year. Okay, so at least you have a target to work with. And you're going to know earlier in the season that, look, if we're going to fall short of this, you know, we can make up the difference somehow or maybe we need to consider reducing stock numbers. Look, Richard, there is this relatively short winter period in James's system, both for the cattle and sheep, given the nature of the ground, but the silage quality is very important in both. Just maybe paint a picture, like how big a difference does it make in making that cut when James is talking about mid-May versus maybe holding out for a bulk cut later on in the year? Yeah, it's going to make a huge difference. Um, like if, if we look at the difference between maybe 75 DMD silage versus 65 DMD silage, 
in terms of yo's pre-lambing, the amount of meal that they're going to require, the 75 DMD silage, you'll get away with maybe feeding her about 15, 15 and a half kilos. And meal will need to be introduced for, to, on the twin bearing yo until six weeks out from lambing. Compared to the 65 DMD silage, she's going to need meal from eight weeks out pre-lambing and will probably consume closer to 30 kilos, around, around 28 kilos. So there's a huge saving alone in making good quality silage and can be simply done by cutting earlier. Like once that seed head appears, your DMD is already around 70%. So every couple of days that you leave it after that, you're dropping another point in DMD. There's a lot of people worrying out there when they spread nitrogen. Is the nitrogen gone? Will the nitrogen spoil the silage? If we get good growthy conditions, there's no reason why that silage, that grass, shouldn't be using up three to four units a day. So rarely it's an issue that there's too much nitrogen left in the silage. If there's good green leafy material in the silage, the sugars will be high enough to combat that anyway. Um, so that's not an, an area that sh should be concerned. Your main area is taking it when it is leafy and get that high DMD silage to save on concentrate feed. And the key priority now when the highest grow or heading towards the highest growing period, we should really capitalize on it. Yeah, exactly. Like James, I suppose that's the other challenge going forward. You're probably in that system of products making a lot of surplus bills. It's a bit more challenging this year. You'd mentioned earlier to me that you're looking at the option of red clover and you're putting in some of that this year as well as a silage crop. Yeah, so yeah, we we um we went for the scheme there that was released recently there. And we're going to put in eight acres of it, some of the silage ground. Um, look, the silage ground here is a long time since it was reseeded, and really with the price of fertilizer and everything, we just said we're better off getting a decent swart of grass in it as opposed to feeding an old, unproductive swart. So we we reseeded eight acres. It's going in with red clover, and there's another ten acres that will win with a standard uh, cut and graze mix. But um, yeah, it's just to get the benefit out of this pricey fertilizer. I suppose the main point of it. And look, when we're touching on that, I know you've an interest, and you mentioned this to us, a recent grass walk of trying to rejuvenate some of them swords and trying to oversow some clover this year. What's your plans for that? So, yeah, the the, the eight, eight and a half acres I've locked up there for uh, to cut the second week of May. I'm, I'm probably hoping to go in maybe after I get the cut of bales off it and oversaw a bit of clover into it um, just to see how it goes and uh, maybe maybe do a, a paddock or maybe do two paddocks then going forward every year if, if, if it turns out to be a success so that's the that's the plan going forward anyways hopefully so you're aiming to rotate around the farm so the key thing there is you're just focusing on a particular area and doing it early in the season that's it Karen. yeah I like this farm dries out very quick like so the window for over so long over I think was really you know into May and after that then I think it's just yeah, it, until, or maybe moisture in the back end or something until you get a bit of rain. But generally speaking, some are extremely dry here. So, yeah, I think it's just trying to focus every, maybe every year, get a paddock or two in a May into, into a bit of clover, maybe. Look at the system changing every year. It's about making small changes and trying to improve them. James, it was really great getting an insight in your system. Rachel, thanks you very much as well for that update on it. No problem at all. OK, we're going to have to leave the episode there at this point. Hopefully, we'll be able to catch up with James in a later episode hear how that Clover Incorporation has went from and what impact it has had on the system. As Rachel has outlined, completing a follow budget is a key thing we should consider at the moment. I've included a link to that budget in the description of this podcast. Again, it's something we need to focus on as well as the production of high quality silage for next winter. That's it for me for this episode. Again, for any updates on the programme, keep an eye on our Twitter page at Chocolate Sheep. I'm Kieran Lynch. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe and listen in to any of our episodes.